Welcome back to Bumblebee viewers. We're kicking off September with a bewitching video. The top 10 scary women from medieval times that will give you nightmares. Wicked woman number 10 is La Quintrala, a pretty sick nickname earned from her flaming red hair. Her true name, however, is Catalina de los Rios de Lesperger, and she was a Chilean aristocrat and landowner. The first mention of her name is when her aunt accuses her at the ripe age of 18 of poisoning and killing her own father. Seems to be genetic because her mother killed several people via poison before being sentenced to death for it. Similar to the Hungarian Countess Elizabeth Bathory, who we'll be covering shortly in this video, Catalina was a violent, tempered woman with a fondness for tormenting her indigenous forced laborers. The situation became so dire that the captive workers revolted and escaped into the mountains. Catalina, however, was crazy loaded, so she easily organized a search party who hunted down the escapees and brought them back to be brutally killed. Besides her forced laborers, Catalina also killed her various lovers and and a priest. And like Bathory before her, Catalina used her fabulous wealth to avoid justice for several years, even donating a large portion of her estate to the Catholic Church to keep him off her trail. Eventually, in 1634, Catalina was publicly accused one too many times, and the church's hand was actually forced, only to investigate and find the claims of 40 plus killings were substantiated. But she buys her way out. I shit you not, she bought her way out. So she went on killing as usual until 1662 when at the assistance of officials and the public, she was finally jailed. Catalina was getting old at that point and her health began deteriorating rapidly while waiting trial and she dies before she ever sees the courtroom at age 61, which is remarkably old for that time period. Wicked woman number nine is the She-Wolf of France. Ah, classic. It starts because Isabella of France is married to England's Edward II in 1308 when they were young, gangly, and awkward. As they grew up together, having four children and ruling didn't really bring them together. Mostly because Edward II is pretty commonly thought to be gay in a modern perspective. He spent every living, breathing second he could with Hugh Dispenser the Younger. Hugh and Isabella hated one another. A physical beard versus a metaphorical one. Want to play house with your boyfriend? That was fine by her. But Hugh was treated by Edward the way a queen would be when Isabella was not. And she didn't stand for that shit at all. But then, shocker, 1324, Edward declared war on his bro-in-law, Charles IV of France and add insult to injury, Edward confiscated Isabella's lands and possessions just to ensure she wouldn't show loyalty to her brother while they duked it out. Isabella then had to bounce back and forth between the two men and the countries, negotiating peace and also manipulating the stupid men into getting along. She pulled cunning little tricks like having her son, Edward III, swear loyalty to Charles, producing an unlikely alliance between the French and the English. By that point, Isabella returns to England once more, tired of her now ex-husband's malarkey. And because she wanted to go remove Dispenser from Edward II's court that badly, y'all. Her husband refused, naturally, to give up his boy toy, which turned out to be a big fat mistake. So in 1326, Isabella, who had also found herself a lover of her own named Roger Mortimer, invaded England anyway just to stick it to her ex-husband. Almost immediately, Edward II's popular support crumbled, and Edward III, Isabella's son, became king. Oh, and she did kill Hugh. Isabella was pretty happy about that. Wicked Woman number 8 has been name-dropped already. It's the Bloody Countess, aka Elizabeth Bathory, a Hungarian noblewoman and serial slayer who took hundreds of lives in her own arguably short one. The woman was raised by her auntie and uncle in a gothic style castle said to be riddled with Satanism and the occult, as well as the overlaps of pleasure and pain in the dungeon, if you catch my drift. Anyways, homegirl married this dude named Count Ferenik Nadasi, which sounds pretty vampire-y, and at this point, the teen had already started picking up tormenting people and animals for fun. So much so that rumors say when she moved in, into her husband's castle, he reportedly built her a torment chamber. Bathory began to pick off the servants, driving needles under nail beds, slicing girls' arms open and dousing them with honey before forcing them to walk outside on a hot summer day to be absconded by bugs. She also would peel back flesh in macabre experiments. After her husband passed in 1604, Bathory's actions became more extreme, finally going after victims people would care about, such as nobility or noticeable members of the community, even with indications that she ate the flesh of her living and dead victims and that she bathed in human blood. In case you couldn't figure it out, she is the inspiration for the famous female vampiress Carmilla. When Bathory went on trial, she was accused of killing 80 people, as that's all they could find evidence of. They knew the woman had killed hundreds, however, and she was found guilty, but instead of being killed, was given house arrest. Wicked woman number seven is Ibra. So, it's unfortunate to say the least, but whether she deserved it or not, Ibra of the West Saxons isn't famous for being an evil queen. Maybe it's because she's the sole daughter of the powerful 8th century King Offa of 
Mercia, the first king of the English, who had nabbed the throne through cold-blooded killing. Offa arranged to marry his very competent and surprisingly well-educated daughter to the King Beatrix of Wessex in 789, who needed help in fighting off a claim to his throne from a man named Egbert. They do achieve this, and Egbert, hilarious name, is driven into the lap of the court of Charlemagne. Meanwhile, Bishop Asser continues Eadbra's story in his life of King Alfred. So how it goes is after their marriage, Idbra dominated the crap out of the feeble Beatrix. She was active in politics, economics, and asserting her own rights. Sure, Beatrix retained his title as king, but all charters were issued in Offa's name, thanks to his loving daughter. But according to Asser, also a hilarious name, Ibra would allow her husband no confidant. She would denounce anyone he liked or trusted, and if he wouldn't listen and discard them, she simply poisoned them, which worked out fine, until one day the teacups got swapped around Princess Bride style, and her husband drank the poison and died in 802. Now Egbert is recalled and given the throne. In a weird switcheroo, Ibra runs off to Charlemagne's court and tries to curry favor. Instead he punks her, gives her a covenant, tells herself to get busy running that. Except it ends up being a little like Aubrey Plaza in The Little Hours, and she gets booted out for banging a dude. She would live a life of poverty and misery until her death, wandering the streets of Pavia in northern Italy begging. And speaking of convents, Wicked Woman number 6 is Helois. Imagine not even being 20 yet, and you're renowned as the most educated woman in Europe. That was the life of Helois, a sweet little nun with a big old brain. Then there was Peter Adelard, arguably the most brilliant philosopher of his time, who had already caused an uproar among the intellectual classes. You know a philosopher is good if everyone in their time hates them, let's be honest. And then there's the link in the chain, Helois's uncle. Fulbert was a clergyman at the church of Notre Dame in Paris and hired Peter to tutor the girl. However, soon after they met, Heloi and Peter began to exchange amorous glances. Glances that then transformed into soft touches. Peter would later write how he intended to break his lifelong chastity with the student entrusted to him, and so he did. My hand strayed oftener to her bosom than the pages Peter openly confesses in writing. Our desires left no stage of lovemaking untried, and if love could devise something new, we welcomed it. Hooey! Damn, Peter! I'm not gonna lie, I was like blushing like an MF trying to write that part of the script. Talk about game! Meanwhile, Helois is thrilled to learn she's pregnant! Hooray! Because a pregnant nun and her older philosopher teacher who seduced her isn't the most disastrous affair the Notre Dame could conceive. In 1118, this couple became the gossip of Paris even after they'd wed. Unfortunately for them, Uncle Fulbert didn't have this kind of tutoring in mind, and so Peter is tragically devoid of his man bits by hired thugs. Apparently, his love center was stored in the uh down there, because Peter abandoned Helois immediately after, who in turn wrote him some epic slam pieces such as, it would be dearer and more honorable to me to be called your wh They're gonna bleep that, but it's the one that starts with the W. Ultimately, Helois became head nun at the Part of the and lived out her days happily there. Wicked Woman number five is the Black Widow, another creepy cool nickname. If you haven't seen it already, we talked a little bit about Catherine de Medici in the recent Bumblebee video, Top 10 Repulsive Queens with Disturbing Reputations. She's famous for being being in a super unhappy arranged marriage where she gets cheated on a bunch despite actually loving her husband, and in turn forces her daughter into an arranged marriage wherein it's the reverse, and she hates her husband and involves herself in affairs. Just your classic case of a mother taking her suffering out on her daughter rather than trying to break the cycle. Anywho, Medici is remembered as one of the medieval Europe's most violent women for a different reason other than killing her daughter's lovers in front of her. The Italian noblewoman and queen of France is the mastermind behind the Saint Bartholomew's Day Mass killing. For those unfamiliar, in August of 1572, a bunch of Catholics get all riled up and organized into a mob that goes and absolutely murks a bunch of the Huguenots, aka French Calvinist Protestants. Apparently, they killed about 20,000 of these people. Wicked Woman number four is Hereditary. Uh-oh, we got double trouble, my ladies, gents, and different compartments. In the early years of the 14th century, the Weger queen Joan of Navarre, second wife to King Henry IV of England, was accused of using evil magic to try and kill her stepson. Say the accusation was vague at best, as was her supposed method, simply put, some dumbass in a crowd pointed a finger at her and said, that lady tried to kill him in a most evil and terrible manner. And the entire group of men went, yeah. 
Yeah, that sounds right. That's that's right. And then they just toss her in a cell. Ironically, the same stepson she's accused of trying to murk frees her from the cell. However, a few decades go by, and now Joan's stepdaughter-in-law, Duchess Eleanor Cobham, is also accused of using evil magic. This time, more seriously though, to kill the King Henry V of England. Yes, every man who was allegedly going to be poisoned was named Henry. Welcome to my hell as a history writer. Eleanor's accusation had a hell of a lot more traction though, as she allegedly had several highly educated members of the clergy use necromancy and other means of sorcery to cause Henry's death. This was crucial because in the early and confusing days of witchcraft, it would have not been credible for Eleanor as a woman, especially of lower birth, to have performed necromancy herself. So what does Eleanor do to seal the courts in her favor? She finds a healer woman previously accused of witchcraft and instead of admitting to trying to kill the king through magic, Eleanor claims she used the female witch for love potions to conceive a child with her husband. She knows since she was once a mistress before wife, she fits the mold of a loose emotional woman who would resort to love magic far more readily. The previously accused woman is immediately put to death. Eleanor meanwhile gets divorced from her husband and imprisoned for life. On a roll with the witch accusations, wicked woman number three is Dame Alice Kytaler. So this is the story of the first woman in Ireland to receive a witch trial on the dramatic charges of worshipping the devil, killing multiple husbands, and even intercourse with a demon. So let's get started. Alice marries William Outlaw in 1280 and has a son with him, but her following three husbands, they yield no children. However, all men were wealthy and died under undocumented conditions. By the time her fourth husband had died, the stepchildren in the mix were seething. Her wealthy husbands had all bequeathed their fortunes and lands to her, a woman, over them? Which in the year 1200 logic was literally implausible. Forgetting the power of the P word, these stepchildren, suspicious of their father's deaths and bitter over their loss of income, became convinced she had access to supernatural powers to dispose of her husbands. Bishop Richard Lettery is super down with this accusation and decides to take it a step further. He accuses Alice, her son, and ten others of being a group who, to quote, concocted powders and potions mixed in the skull of a decapitated robber, surrounded by candles of human fat and accompanied with horrible incantations that brought illness or death to the innocent Christians. Dame Alice was said to have had a private demon, her incubus, with whom she had adulterous relations to earn her wealth. Did they forget that the husbands gave her wealth? It's not like she, anyway, never mind. Alice's maid Petronilia was flogged, as was everyone else honestly, on the bishop's orders, but she folded like a punk and publicly confirmed that each of the charges were true. Alice, as the alleged leader of the group, was condemned to burn at the stake by the king's council itself, but it never took place. Alice was a step ahead. She scooped up Petronilia's daughter and fled the country never to be seen again. While Alice escaped the deadly punishment, a host of witch trials took place afterwards thanks to her, and in the end her maid Petronilla is burned alive. Wicked woman number two is Matilda. And no, not the cute bowl cut Matilda from Danny DeVito movie that can heal all childhood wounds. I'm talking about the Matilda who killed at the war game until she destroyed herself not knowing when to let go. Matilda of Canossa is one of the most powerful women in the Middle Ages and the preemptive political force in medieval Italy. She is best known for her military prowess in defending her lands and the authority of Pope Gregory from the aggression of Henry IV of the Holy Roman Empire. When he had become king, he was too young to be efficient and the papacy had turned to Matilda for protection. Protection. All of her siblings and fathers had died, leaving her as heir. She organized peasant battles against anti-popes and personally supervised military operations and expeditions while ably managing the affairs of the state which included administration over a vast kingdom. But Pope Gregory and Henry had blowout after blowout after blowout and in the end Matilda's forced to side with the Pope over her bitter cousin. Decades of war followed but Matilda holds her own. Following the death of Gregory, Matilda continued to defend the papacy and her reign until finally defeating Henry in a battle personally in 1095, and then losing pretty much all of her power as a result. It was worth it to her, however, and in 1111, she was crowned Imperial Vicar and Vice Queen of Italy by Henry. In 1633, hundreds of years after Matilda's passing, her body is actually reburied at St. Peter's Basilica. She's one of only six women to receive the honor. And now wicked woman number one is Julia Tofana. Poison's in the name, and baby, it's the game. This will be the most successful lady you have ever heard the name of, and I'm talking 100 percent out range when it comes to successful deaths. Best part, she doesn't do the killing herself, and that's how smart ladies avoid catching a charge, at least for a while. Giuliana Tolfana killed hundreds of men in the late slash post middle age renaissance Italy when she decided one morning to just turn her makeup business into a poison factory. She specialized in the perfect product, a deadly concoction called Aqua Tolfana, thought to have been laced with arsenic, lead, and of course belladonna. Tolfana made it her mission and her business to help 
aspiring widows live their dream of being rid of husbands. Now this wasn't some money making scheme, well maybe it was for some of these women. Instead the reason Tofana got into the game was it was an era of arranged marriages, one that left no possibility of divorces thanks to the church doctrine at the time, which supported and encouraged the fact that once married, husbands had complete control over their wives, and women were able to be completely powerless, facing any punishment, bodily violation, beating, or cruelty their husbands saw fit. This meant the only way out of an unhappy union was death. Aqua Tofana provided a quick discreet solution. Tofana's goal was to keep her poison secret so she could continue to sell the potent concoction. She managed to fool authorities for nearly 50 years with the help of her devoted staff of women. She was careful to only sell products to ladies she knew or women that had been vetted by past clients until one day it all comes crashing down. One dumbass gets cold feet and snitches her plan. Tofana was smart and fled to a church to claim sanctuary where she remained until the government violated the rules of sanctuary and dragged her out. They tormented the woman for days until she admitted to having contributed to at least 600 deaths. Tofana alongside her daughter and shop staff are sentenced to death in Rome in 1659. Alrighty, well that's the end of another video. I hope you enjoyed. Take some time to subscribe to The Hive to see more of our regularly posted content. And don't forget to drop a like, a comment down below.